So the work that I'll uh, talk about today is really a, a collaboration between theory and experiment. So on the uh, experiment side is my postdoc, Antonio Rossi. And on the theory side is Giacomo Resta, who is a uh, grad student of Sergei Sabrasov at UC Davis. Um, so I hope uh, I'll do uh, Giacomo justice when I present his DFT calculations. Um, this, uh, the experiments were done at the advanced light source at uh, Berkeley Labs, where Antonio also has a partial appointment. And our samples come from the 2D Crystal Consortium at Penn State. So um, the experiments were done at, uh, at the Maestro beamline at the advanced light source. And the M in Maestro stands for microscopy. So this is a uh, beamline that has really been one of the pioneers in taking photo emission techniques into the realm of microscopy. So they have a number of uh, experiments uh, available here, uh, uh, such as uh, Lee and Peem, uh, but more uh, relevant to this talk is nano ARPES and micro ARPES, which uh, provide, whoops, this slide gets away from me, which provide either uh, a spot size uh, below a micron for nano ARPES or uh, a spot size of on the order of uh, several microns or several tens of microns uh, for the micro ARPES setup. So for the uh, experiments that I'll show you today, we use the micro ARPES system uh, and uh, we also used a uh, potassium uh, source uh, that uh, is available there. And I'll uh, discuss in a little bit of, of detail what this does in case uh, someone is not familiar with this method of, of surface preparation in ARPES. And we don't actually put a banana in the ultra high vacuum uh, system. Okay, so uh, potassium uh, dosing is uh, a relatively uh, ubiquitous uh, tuning knob that uh, is available at most, if not all, uh, uh, synchrotron ARPES end stations nowadays. And basically, uh, you dump potassium on the surface of a crystal after it is cleaved. And um, the most uh, simple thing that uh, it does is it donates electrons to the sample. Sometimes uh, you can also have the displacement field uh, from the positive ions that are left over uh, contributing to, uh, to the observed spectra. So uh, what potassium uh, dosing uh, does in its most rudimentary uh, um, uh, implementation uh, is it uh, gives us a little help with one downside of ARPES, which is that only occupied states are observed. So this is something that is well known. We're subjected to the Fermi-Dirac cutoff. Uh, we can do a little bit better uh, populating some on unoccupied states by raising the temperature. But another way to uh, occupy uh, the initially unoccupied states without raising the temperature is dumping potassium or another alkali metal on the surface. This can uh, uh, add electrons and uh, bring up the chemical potential, exposing states that were uh, previously unoccupied. So usually this is just a technique for shifting the chemical potential a little bit, but occasionally something more interesting does happen. And our motivation uh, for this work was uh, really this idea of looking for new uh, phases via this relatively rudimentary way of uh, in situ uh, materials uh, tuning. So there are a number of examples uh, in the recent literature where uh, people uh, dose potassium and observe something more interesting than just a chemical potential shift. So uh, one example is this electric field tuned uh, topological phase transition in ultra thin uh, sodium three bismuth. So in the uh, ultra thin regime, sodium three bismuth is actually a quantum spin hall insulator. And these authors claim that with the uh, displacement field that appears uh, when uh, the potassium uh, uh, atoms uh, uh, donate their electrons, uh, you can actually have uh, an electric field uh, tuned uh, topological uh, phase transition. Another example uh, from the 2D materials world is uh, this work where in tungsten disulfide uh, there uh, is uh, a band over here which is split by spin orbit coupling and with, uh, uh, with uh, potassium dosing they're actually uh, able to uh, enhance uh, this uh, splitting implying uh, an enhancement of the spin orbit coupling. 
And uh, these sorts of techniques uh, have been uh, used quite a bit in the iron-based superconductors where carrier tuning uh, does play an important role. And there are some surprising results uh, there. For example, uh, this work uh, claiming that the superconducting gap uh, with potassium dosing is actually enhanced beyond uh, what it is uh, in the optimally doped uh, bulk crystal. So uh, you'll notice on uh, this, uh, uh, this graph that uh, the plots, uh, the plot uh, corresponding to the potassium dosing uh, has uh, 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 40 seconds, 90 seconds, 130 seconds. So that is the tuning knob that we actually have in the experiments. Uh, we can control um, uh, how long uh, we've been uh, depositing potassium on the surface. This is not a good way to determine how many electrons have actually been added, and I'll come back to that in a little bit. Okay, so to have the highest probability of actually getting something more interesting than a chemical potential shift uh, with potassium dosing, it helps to have a material that does a lot of different things. And tungsten ditelride is one of those multifunctional materials that is characterized by extreme tunability. And this slide is intentionally busy and I uh, don't expect you to read all of it. I'll uh, discuss the relevant pieces in a little bit. Um, but uh, today I'll be discussing the bulk system, but I'll remind you if you're not following the 2D materials field, that uh, this material can also be exfoliated down to a monolayer or or, uh, or several layers. And in that regime, it actually becomes a quantum spin hall insulator, perhaps one of the most robust examples that has been found thus far, and it becomes superconducting uh, with, uh, with gating. All right, so in uh, the case of bulk tungsten ditalride, um, it turns out that many of the uh, emergent phenomena in that material, um, carrier tuning, plays an important role one way or another. So this material first rose to prominence uh, a few years ago because of its large and non-saturating magneto resistance. So this was attributed to uh, a perfect compensation between uh, electron and hole pockets. Uh, and uh, there is photo emission support for that, but it's uh, maybe not fully accepted in the community. But anyway, that's the uh, most common explanation for the large and non-saturating magneto resistance. More recently, uh, this uh, material uh, became prominent uh, as a predicted uh, type two while semi-metal that was tunable by either strain or, uh, or molybdenum alloying. So a type two while semi-metal is characterized by tilted uh, wild cones instead of uh, ones uh, that uh, obey uh, 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 Lorentz symmetry. So, um, uh, so this uh, prediction uh, uh, has been pursued by many different ARPES groups. I would say from the photo emission side of things, and I can come back to this in the Q&A if people are, are really curious, uh, the uh, ARPES uh, evidence that it's a type two while semi-metal, the direct evidence is fairly tenuous and I think it would be almost impossible to confirm in this specific compound, but there are uh, transport signatures that support uh, this uh, this prediction, uh, which I can't comment on their veracity because uh, it's not my expertise, but for the transport signatures to uh, be uh, observed, uh, one has to electron dope because the wild points are actually located approximately 80 milli electron volts above EF. And finally, another exciting result in bulk tungsten ditelride is the observation of pressure induced uh, superconductivity, hydrostatic pressure. So um, in, uh, in, uh, hydro in these uh, experiments, uh, it, it appears that superconductivity only emerges when, first of all, the large and non-saturated magneto resistance goes away, and also when there's a change uh, in, in the, the sign uh, of, of, the, of the Hall number. So uh, clearly, uh, uh, carrier tuning does a, a multitude of things, and tuning carriers is a reliable method to get uh, new phenomena in tungsten ditelluride. So uh, moving on to the ARPES data, and there's one uh, important complication uh, 
uh, in the RPES spectra of this material that actually helps us uh, 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 narrow down uh, the, uh, the explanation of what we ultimately see with uh, potassium dosing. So uh, it was reported of, by the Baumberger group a few years ago that uh, this material, uh, it actually has two non-equivalent uh, uh, cleaved surfaces, which uh, we call face A and face B. So if you have one sample, you cleave it, you flip it over, uh, you cleave it, you're going to get a different spectra. You're going to get these two different types of spectra. And this is attributed to a very subtle uh, inversion symmetry breaking uh, along the C-axis, where uh, in one uh, tungsten ditelride block, you have your tungsten layer, and then you have tellurium atoms above and below. And the average tellurium height above and below are actually a little bit different, which leads to the different spectra uh, in uh, different terminations. So let me walk you through uh, these spectra. Um, so first of all, the electron pocket is here, or I should say pockets rather, there's two of them, uh, a little bit further from the gamma point, and then the whole pocket is here, closer to the gamma point. And the characteristic of face A, at least before we add potassium, is that there is a gaping hole right here, a region of no uh, bands. Uh, this is in contrast to face B, where uh, you have your electron in your hole pocket, but you have this V-shaped feature uh, that uh, appears between the two of them. So this V-shaped feature uh, has been uh, observed by every RPES group that measured these materials, uh, and it has been uh, shown to be a surface-like band. So with photon energy, it does not disperse, indicating that it's two-dimensional. Um, so because it is two-dimensional and it looks sort of arky, uh, it was sometimes uh, incorrectly attributed uh, to uh, the Fermi arcs uh, connecting while points. Um, so that is not the case actually, um, because if you actually look where the while points are, they're very close together and they are not connected by that uh, surface state. So this large surface state, um, I, I don't wanna say it's topologically trivial because there are now uh, uh, proposals that it's uh, not topologically irrelevant. So I'll just say that it's not uh, uh, related to the predicted uh, type two while well setting metal. So, these are uh, DFT calculations, uh, slab calculations, obviously, because we're interested in uh, surface uh, states. And uh, in uh, all of the calculations I'll show, darker colors indicate a more surface-like band and lighter colors indicate a more bulk-like band. So these calculations uh, reproduce uh, the, the fact that one of the faces has these surface states uh, between the electron and the hole-like pockets, and the other one does not. So you guys probably uh, see these uh, states near gamma, and uh, these also show up in the calculations, uh, but um, it turns out that they're uh, just a little bit below EF, which is why they don't show up in these, uh, these contours, which are exactly at EF. So uh, with uh, photo emission uh, uh, Fermi surface maps, we have some uh, integration uh, window in energy, which uh, makes us uh, see uh, states that are just a little bit uh, below EF. Okay, so uh, moving on now to the uh, dispersions in energy and momentum. So here they are for face A and face B. Uh, so as a, a corollary of a material that does a lot of different things, you often end up with a rather complicated uh, band structure. Um, but I'll assure you that most of these uh, states over here are bulk states, and they're the same for face A and face B, because it's only the surface uh, terminations that are different. So where we do see differences, uh, other than the gamma point, which will not be the focus of the discussion today, is uh, here at around uh, Kx equals 0.3, where on face A, between the electron and the whole band, we see nothing, whereas on face B, between the electron and the whole band, we see uh, this sort of uh, teardrop-shaped uh, feature. Okay, so now we uh, add potassium. We, uh, we uh, add electrons. And there are changes that happen in uh, both of the faces. And um, this change occurs for a very small amount of potassium dosing, corresponding to a shift 
in chemical potential of approximately 30 milli electron volts. So uh, I mentioned uh, earlier that the uh, control knob that we have as an experimentalist is how much uh, time we've been evaporating potassium on the surface. So that is not a good way to surmise how many electrons that you've added because uh, the, the way it happens is the first uh, couple of potassium atoms, uh, uh, they usually do donate their electrons. But what that does is it sets up an electric field that opposes uh, further potassium atoms from uh, donating their electrons. So initially, uh, potassium is deposited pretty much all ionized, but as you deposit more and more, it uh, becomes uh, more uh, neutral. So, uh, so uh, the amount of charge that's contributed is not a linear function of how much time you've been dumping potassium on the surface. So what we can uh, determine pretty accurately in our experiments is how much the chemical potential has shifted. We do this by lining up the bands as best as we can before and after. Um, and if, if one wants to make some uh, 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 I guess uh, predictions uh, or hypotheses about how uh, how the charges uh, distribute in the uh, top several unit cells. Uh, you can uh, connect this uh, to the number of electrons. But what we can rigorously measure is the shift in the chemical potential. Okay. So with that disclaimer out of the way, let me walk you through uh, what we actually see. So on face A. Uh, initially, there was a gaping hole between the electron and the hole-like band, and afterwards it has been filled by some states, and exactly the opposite thing is observed on face B. Initially, there were states, and then they are gone. And if you don't uh, believe uh, this uh, image that they're gone, I'll show you a Fermi surface map that, that maybe shows it a little bit clearer. So, um, interestingly, it also looks like face A and face B has, have kind of uh, 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 switched. So initially, there was nothing on face A. Afterwards, there's nothing on face B between the electron and, and hole pockets. And I'll explain uh, uh, a little bit later why this coincidence actually makes sense. Okay, so, um, so one, an, another way to decompensate uh, electrons and holes in tungsten ditelluride is by raising the temperature. So it was found uh, that this material undergoes a Lifshitz transition at around 160 Kelvin, uh, where the whole pocket uh, vanishes uh, uh, below uh, EF, or rather it doesn't vanish, but it, uh, uh, it goes below EF. And uh, uh, qualitatively, this looks a lot like adding electrons, but if we actually look at the spectra, and this is uh, 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 from a paper a few years ago, so these are spectra on face A, and I don't know if you can see clearly, but uh, at low temperature, there is nothing between the electron and hole band over here. And then above the Lifshitz transition, it is fuzzy, but there's still not a band there, which would be uh, very uh, clear if it was present. So it looks like there is something different about adding electrons versus uh, decompensating carriers with, with temperature. Okay. So here's the doping uh, induced change in fermiology. So we have uh, before uh, the potassium doping, we have our gaping hole and we have our V-shaped uh, surface feature. And then uh, after dosing, uh, you have a feature appearing here where there was once a gaping hole. And then you have a gap uh, appearing on face B where there was once this uh, V-shaped uh, surface state. So uh, we can uh, focus a little bit closely on the uh, momentum region where this change is actually happening right here in the uh, green boxes, which are lined up for all the images. And here in the bottom panel, we show the difference plot uh, where uh, before or where on face A, you have an overall uh, increase in spectral weight in this region. Uh, whereas on face B, you have an overall uh, decrease of spectral weight in this region. Okay, so to guide uh, how we think about uh, uh, this uh, observation, uh, let me say a little bit about uh, crystal structure. So uh, tungsten ditelluride is always in the same structural phase at all temperatures, and it's called the gamma phase, uh, uh, also called the TD phase. 
Um, this is in contrast to a related compound, molly ditelluride, which has many of the uh, uh, same emergent bulk phases, but it actually undergoes a structural phase transition where it is this other structural phase at room temperature, and then at low temperature, it goes into the uh, uh, gamma phase. So this other uh, uh, structural phase is called beta, or 1T prime, and it differs from the gamma phase in uh, uh, so the difference can be described in two different ways. So one way to describe it is a four degree tilt in the unit cell. Um, another way to think about it is you have a, a, a series of small planar shear displacements of subsequent uh, tungsten ditelluride layers. And it's this language that will be uh, most useful for uh, talking about the theory that I'll show next. So the distinction between these structures is uh, important for a number of reasons. So if you're interested in uh, what topological phase uh, the, the crystal uh, supports, uh, this is uh, kind of an underlying uh, principle. And there was a prediction a few years ago that this uh, structural phase transition, which it does not happen uh, 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 as a function of temperature, can be driven by hole doping. And uh, later on, there was an observation that uh, it can be uh, driven by a terahertz uh, driving field, where the mechanism there is really to drive these small uh, planar shear displacements. So as a disclaimer, I'm not claiming that we're observing this bulk structural phase transition, but we're observing something that at the end of the day ends up uh, looking kind of similar. So I should mention, if one wants to distinguish these bulk structural phases um, uh, via photo emission, it's very uh, difficult. The bulk bands are actually almost uh, identical. The changes are so minute that I don't think they could be experimentally resolved. Um, but it turns out that the surface states uh, on these different uh, structural phases uh, on the two non-equivalent phases are doing very different things. Okay. So uh, uh, we want to think of this structural phase transition as a shear displacement. And uh, these uh, calculations so show the uh, uh, configurational energy uh, 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 with various shear displacements of one layer. And this uh, calculation is for the bulk. So uh, without doping, which is the orange, uh, the gamma phase is the minimum, no surprise there. Uh, with hole doping, it actually reduces repulsion between adjacent tellurium antibonding orbitals. So the minimum energy is at a shear displacement of 0.3, which does correspond to the beta phase. And with electron doping, which is the green and the red, uh, the global minimum of the energy moves uh, to a small negative shear displacement, uh, but still uh, pretty much the gamma phase. Uh, but then there is a local minimum that develops at, uh, at a shear displacement of 0.8 angstrom, which we call the metastable phase. And here is the same thing, but for a slab uh, geometry, um, where uh, 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 the qualitative observations are exactly the same, but uh, uh, quantitatively, the difference between uh, the energy of the metastable and the global minimum uh, with electron doping becomes much reduced. So it should be noted that it's difficult uh, to distinguish these uh, uh, energy differences of one or two milli electron volts uh, in this material because of the difficulty in modeling the van der Waals interactions. So it is possible that in reality, the metastable phase uh, is the, the global minimum, or it's also possible that in our uh, experiments, other details such as the displacement field um, uh, or uh, relaxation near the surface uh, drive uh, this to be the global minimum. And I'm putting this out there because our data are very consistent uh, with this explanation of a shear uh, uh, displacement of 0.8 uh, angstrom. So let me walk you through that. So these are slab calculations showing subsequent shear displacements of, uh, of one uh, layer, uh, and this is modeling phase A. So the experimental observation is uh, before there's nothing between the electron and, and hole band, afterwards there's something there. So starting with zero shear displacement, initially there's a band that is above EF, but as the top layer is sheared uh, 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 to the, the right, uh, you can see this band pushing below EF. And if we have a more fair comparison, um, uh, blocking uh, the uh, part that ARPES does not see, uh, you can see that the experimental observation of now you don't really see it, and now you see it is very much captured uh, by 
uh, this uh, model of a shear displacement of, of the top layer. Additionally, the uh, beta structural phase, uh, the surface state that it produces, uh, does also have that same qualitative property in that on one of the faces, uh, there's a surface state that, that is found uh, below uh, the, the chemical potential. So doing the same calculation on face uh, B, uh, so that's the one where first you see it and then you don't, uh, this is what is observed. So initially, without any shear displacement, there is a surface-like band that is uh, below the Fermi energy. And with successive shear displacements, it gradually gets uh, pushed up. Uh, and then finally, if we compare it to an ARPES experiment where we don't see unoccupied states, first you see it, and then you don't see it. And again, the beta structural phase gives qualitative uh, agreement with the experimental observation uh, as well as this metastable phase. So there is this intriguing um, uh, coincidence, uh, two intriguing coincidences that I've pointed out. So one is that with, uh, with potassium dosing, the different uh, terminations seem to switch. So the spectra that were initially characteristic of phase A afterwards become characteristic of phase B. The other coincidence is that uh, the spectra qualitatively look an awful lot like the beta phase, uh, which uh, we don't claim to be actually uh, producing because it is energetically unfavorable. But if you compare the, what the, uh, the crystal structures, this coincidence starts to make sense. So uh, this is the metastable phase, so 0.8 angstrom uh, shift of the top layer compared to the, the gamma phase. And, uh, and, and the region of qualitative agreement is marked by the green box. So uh, in this case, there's only one layer of qualitative agreement, which makes sense because you shifted the top layer and now uh, and you line it up and now everything below disagrees. Um, the second panel is the metastable phase versus uh, the inverted gamma. So basically the uh, orthorhombic phase, but flipped over so that phase A becomes phase B. So here, uh, the, the qualitative agreement uh, extends to uh, the top two layers. And then finally, uh, we have the metastable phase uh, compared to the beta structural phase. And the qualitative agreement is on three uh, 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 layers of tungsten ditelluride. So with this, uh, the qualitative results that, first of all, uh, uh, A and B seem to switch, and secondly, uh, that before you have a uh, good agreement with the gamma phase, which we should, and then after we have qualitative agreement with the uh, uh, beta phase with respect to which uh, uh, surface states we see and we don't see in an experiment that only measures occupied states, uh, this qualitative uh, uh, statement also agrees with uh, our proposal that with potassium dosing, we're able to uh, induce a shear shift of the top layer. So, uh, to conclude, uh, we find that the surface states of tungsten ditelluride are a very sensitive measure of the structural phase because the bulk bands definitely are not. Um, uh, and we also found that a small amount of potassium dosing produces a change in the surface bands that's consistent with a shear displacement of the top unit cell. And then finally, we find that with potassium dosing, the first three layers of the predicted crystal structure that we end up in are consistent with another structural phase that is not realized under ambient conditions. And this is an attractive structural phase uh, because first of all, in ultra-thin uh, tungsten ditelluride, it's actually in this uh, crystal structure that the quantum spin hall insulator is seen. And uh, with superconductivity under pressure, uh, this may also be the structural phase that is relevant, although that is still debated. So that's all I have to say, and um, I'm happy to take questions. No, no, no. So now just uh, to, to the world at large, I want to reveal my uh, ignorance. So the first question I just didn't quite get, um, the shear displacement of the top unit cell, how does that relate to the beta structural phase that you talk about in the next bullet point? I mean, is that the same thing or are there two different structural things going down in the material? Yeah, okay. Yeah, let me, thanks for, for letting me make that more clear. So um, the, uh, the shear displacement is the, uh, the 
the thing that we think is more likely to be happening because it is energetically more favorable. Uh, if we take this, the crystal structure, sorry, let me talk into the mic. If we take the crystal uh, structure with that shear displacement and lay it on top of the beta structural phase, it matches in the top three layers. Oh. So that's where the, the qualitative agreement lies. I see. Great. And then the, the second question, which was related, was I know you had DFT calculations which sort of suggest this uh, mm -hmm. shear. But, but is there a simple physical mechanism that would let one understand why it wants to do this shear on potassium doping? Um, well, um, I'm not sure exactly. So uh, the, the calculations of the energies of the, the configurations, uh, it does show a, a local minimum. How it gets into that local minimum, I'm not sure. Maybe the displacement field uh, plays a role, but I don't have an answer for that. Well, I'm sorry, let, let me just make my question more clear, although I understand that I'm asking a theory question <laughs> and you're, it's not. Uh, but, but my question was not so much how it gets there, but mm -hmm. just what's the reason why that phase, why that local minimum exists on potassium doping? You know, it's just, mm -hmm. it seems it's counterintuitive that you add charge and it wants to make a shear. And yeah. DFT obviously yeah. says it wants to do that. Mm -hmm. The question is just, is there some intuitive understanding of why? Um, yeah, so it's related about uh, where, uh, it's related to where the, uh, the doping actually goes in the, in the uh, tellurium uh, orbitals. So, um, so, with, uh, so with electron doping, they, uh, let me go back to that over here. Um, yeah, so here you can see sort of the, the different uh, bond angles. So uh, here, which would correspond to the beta phase, you have sort of the tellurium atoms on top of each other, which is uh, very much uh, disfavored with electron doping because the electrons go into those tellurium orbitals. Uh, but with a little, with uh, this kind of shift where they're angled towards each other, uh, you can avoid that repulsion. I see, thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Uh, Okay, so let's move on to the next session and ask Ina again for a very nice talk.